Jerry Pennell, OBE. Okay, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. I certainly didn't deliver it by myself. Let me get that uh, out of the way really quick, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we'll be delivered in a moment. I'm going to try and talk for about 20 minutes, but leave you some time for questions at the end. So if you do have questions, just, just hang on to them, and, and we'll try and have time to address them. Um, but before I start, I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you actually attended any of our events in any of the Olympic venues? Okay, it's about a third, I guess. And how many of you logged on to either our website or the website of the BBC or one of the other rights other broadcasters and got some results? Okay, a few more. And how many of you watched some of it on television? Okay. That's kind of pretty much a normal profile. And I do that because it's important to understand the key role in technology in supporting all three of those media channels, particularly the latter, which is still fundamental both the economics and, and the enjoyment of the event. So what I'm going to try and do is talk a little bit about the broad scope of the event. I haven't got long to do it justice. And I'm going to try and pull out some of the key challenges and, and kind of learnings, uh, which may or may not be of use to you or to others in, in their big programs. But let me start by giving you some organization context. There were actually two organizations responsible for delivering the Olympics in London last summer. The organization on, on the right there, the Olympic Delivery Authority, they were the organization that was essentially taxpayer funded, 9.3 billion pounds you've read. And they're basically responsible for building things, essentially a big construction program, building things that are still there today. Things like the stadium, the aquatic center, the whitewater rafting facility at Lee Valley, North London, the, the sailing academy on the south coast at Portland. That's what the ODA did, and a great job they did it too. That was not the organization for which I worked. I worked for the other organization there, LOCOG, uh, the London Organizing Committee for the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. We were the organization chaired by Seb Coe, Chief Executive Paul Dyke, to whom I worked. Um, our mission was really to put on a great games, but without it costing the taxpayer anything. We had to cover all our costs from our revenues. What were our revenues? Broadcast rights. Sponsorship, ticketing, licensing, and merchandising. That all added up to a little over two billion pounds sterling, and then a little under one pound in every four of that went on technology, giving some sense of the scale of it. And I'll talk a little bit more about what's in the scope in a second. So hopefully that gives you some context of what we're about. So we were set up, although we were public sector owned, we were set up on commercial lines, and it was important for us to at least break out, that break even, or perhaps make a small profit. Some other context things are worth flagging up. Some, some of the special factors that make this a bit of a different IT program to have run. I mean, the first one is the obvious one, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We couldn't be right, that's obvious. Um, but some of the other things that, for me, are just as relevant as that fixed deadline. The high profile, the expectations that were being set for the Olympics, largely out with our control. The fact that, and I think this is a big one, the fact that we had only one shot at this, in corporate life, normally you get the, uh, the opportunity to drip feed out functionality, deal with the teething problems, and then fix later. Well, in the Olympics, you know, we had 16 days, and basically what we finished with was what we started with. So you really only had one shot. Another interesting one, which may not be immediately obvious to you, was the life cycle of a, an organizing committee. I don't know how obvious to you this is or not, but how many Olympic Games had we, as an organizing committee, as, a, as an enterprise, ever delivered before last summer? None. Um, so how expert were we, as an organization, some of my colleagues, in delivering Olympics? Not that expert. So in terms of elucidating, eliciting requirements, making some of those key decisions up front, especially given that IT inevitably within the organizing committee had the longest lead times, you can imagine that was in itself an interesting challenge. And then finally, um, most of our key clients and users, people like the broadcasters, the athletes, tend to arrive late. And by late, I mean if it's broadcasters three months out from the event, if it's athletes we're talking in the last six weeks. And guess what? When they turn up, inevitably, there's various changes that they require. So you have to gear yourself up to be able to handle an amount of late, late change. Not fundamental architectural change, 
of physical change, minor tweaks, data items, and so on. So let me just say a, a few words about scope. There was a whole bunch of things we had to deliver as an IT program. Things like accounting systems for the organizing committee, HR systems, email, office. I'm not going to talk about any of that. There was a whole bunch of uh, database applications required to help the organization manage the games. Things like arrivals and departures or uh, accommodation bookings. I'm not going to talk a lot about that either, but there was quite a lot of those. Um, there was a whole bunch of audiovisual technology, video boards in the venues, uh, additional PA systems, uh, Wi-Fi, all of that. Not going to talk a whole lot about any of that either. What I did want to put some emphasis on, though, was the single most mission critical thing that we had to do as a technology team. And it was really that chain of reporting that went from measuring the athletic performance in whatever sport it was, and delivering the result and the associated information to all the different places that needed it. And that's where most of the money went, where most of the risk was, and where most of the challenge lay. Let me just bring that to life for you. When the Usain Bolt won the 100 metres final, okay, he won it in London in 9.62 seconds. And that obviously goes instantly up on the screens. But what also goes instantly up on the screens is, was it a personal best? Actually, no, it wasn't. Was it a world record? Actually, no, it wasn't. Because both of those things were achieved by Usain Bolt at the World Athletics Championships in Berlin in 2009. Was it an Olympic record? Yes, it was. Because the previous Olympic record for the 100 meters, also held by Usain Bolt, was uh, at 9.69 in Beijing 2008. All that information has to be there in venue and put up on the scoreboard, on your TV graphics back home, on the commentator information system, which the, uh, the broadcasters are relying heavily to do their live audio commentary, on your uh, internet access, whatever it might be, our website, the websites, all the broadcast, uh, all the rights of the broadcasters, and fed more or less continuously to all the news agencies, people like Reuters and AP and so on. So if you can imagine behind the scenes of the games, there's all this message passing going on. And to add to the challenge, most of that software for London was brand new for a whole variety of reasons, largely to do with the changing needs of, of journalists in particular. We had to re-architect the system. And in fact, we were the first Olympics to deliver results information in near real time as far as the web across most sports, with all sports, actually, for the Olympics. So that had significant implications, which I will reference later on. That's the core of the scope. It's also the core of the technical challenge. Here are some numbers. I'm not going to read them out, just eyeball them. Top of the left, 110,000 pieces of technical equipment we rolled out to the venues largely in the last six weeks before the games. Half a million concurrent users on the website. My team, my own staff, volunteers, and supply staff peaked at 5,500 staff at the peak in the middle of the Olympics. Uh, the rest of it is self explanatory. So, one of the things I was asked to do here was to talk about some of the potential takeaways, and I thought I'd start here. We had a very clear vision as LOCOP, which was around not delivering the game for its own sake, but using the games as a vehicle to drive change. Two key areas for me, one would be the regeneration of East London, but the second one, and this was very close to Seth's heart, is very close to Seth's heart, is around driving sports participation amongst young people. The powerful thing about having a clear vision and a clear goal, delivering the gate games to enable these things, is the impact it has on all kinds of different parts of your delivery chain. Your own team, their motivation, the motivation of your suppliers, the motivation of all the agencies that we have to work with. Because although Locog and ODA were the key agencies in London last summer, we worked very closely and made high demands on all kinds of agencies, ranging from Transport for London to, uh, to Metropolitan Police and so on. Clear goal and what that enables is key, and I think one of the key ingredients in enabling our access. That'd be the first thing. Second thing worth mentioning is the people side of this. So I mentioned some of the technology challenges earlier on. That was the profile of my team in terms of recruitment up here. 
and then uh, you can see the career prospects, I had to offer them uh, at the end of it. So a lot of those things that um, you would normally rely on in terms of promotion opportunities, even reward, that sort of stuff, we really didn't have. But I guess my message to you now is delivering technology is not about the technology, it's about the people. So the thing we probably focused more on just about than anything else, especially given that profile, was keeping the people motivated, keeping them engaged, making sure they're all lined up to the common goal. Did we do that perfectly? No, but we did it well enough. By the way, I should say, that was my team. We had teams from all our suppliers and sponsors going through a similar cycle of uh, quick growth and even, I mean, faster decline. So, focusing on the team, key. Right, I mentioned um, our sponsors and suppliers there. One thing I think we did get right in London last summer that organisations don't always get right is leveraging what your sponsors and suppliers can bring to the party. We essentially had no choice. We had no choice to start building our own in-house expertise and everything. We had to focus really on getting the most out of these boys and the ones that are not on the screen now because they weren't sponsors as we could. So making that ecosystem work for you was key. We were enormously helped by that common goal that I've already mentioned, enormously helped by the fact that our sponsors' brands were every um, bit as much on the hook for good delivery as, as, as if you like my personal um, brand. So driving that was, was key. So leveraging the supplier ecosystem, that would be my third takeaway. I mentioned that we had a whole bunch of new software. So our single biggest challenge was integrating the software, which was unique for each sport, had to be integrated into a central hub and then distributed to all kinds of channels to get that information out. That results piece um, was the key technical thing we had to do. This was our integration with Test Lab. 56 cells, uh, in Canary Wharf actually, sport by sport, each, each cell was a sport. This one here, you can see that it's tennis, the bottom level there is the primary system, the top level is the backup system. Stuff was tested on a sport by sport basis in the lab, then tested on a multi sport basis, happy path, and then various forms of trouble and disasters. Heavy testing, heavy software development, lots of suppliers involved. Now, here's, here's a slightly uncomfortable message, possibly. We had no consistent or common development methodology. Okay? We had very strong governance and project management. And that worked well for us. And in fact, if we try to impose some kind of common development life cycle across all our different projects, all our different suppliers, internal and external, it would not have worked. So we focused our management around the government and around the project management. And that for me is quite a big takeaway, given what I've seen in, in other organisations delivering large programmes. Okay, the single biggest change in London over previous Olympics was the arrival of these things. Okay? In uh, Beijing in 2008, the iPhone had been out one year. Quite rightly, the Beijing organising committee completely ignored it. We knew in 2009 that the, you know, mobile devices were going to be important. We knew that we didn't know exactly in 2009 what we were going to be, but we knew there'd be a range. We could see even then that the ecosystems that Apple and others were putting in place was going to be important. So responding to this was, was clearly critical. Now, developing apps, given that you've got the sort of results and infrastructure I mentioned before, is actually not that hard. Deciding when to develop those apps is a little harder, and we deliberately decided to develop them late. Because this, uh, this is basically a fashion business and the popular mobile phones just keep changing. So we didn't start developing our apps until late 2011. That wasn't really where my big concern lay. My big concern lay in how to get some infrastructure that was actually going to enable people to use those apps in our venues. Because the nightmare for me, knowing how London's 3G infrastructure was, was that all these people would turn up in common places, like our venues, and then find they couldn't get a data connection. So the big challenge here, actually, was, was an infrastructure challenge. And it was all about working with the mobile network operators and BT. Mobile network operators put in, I think, 17 extra masts in the Olympic Park and 18 off the park. 
and BT put in what was the largest public uh, Wi-Fi um, system <coughs> in Europe, I think, in the park during the games, all so that we could deliver this connectivity to people's phones, and not just for accessing our results app, so that people would drive, user generated content, take pictures and put them on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of this, none of this was scoped in terms of the initial budget for the, um, for the Olympics, and why would it have been? Because the initial budget was set well before this. Um, but we had to find flexible ways of delivering that stuff. So, my comment here is, there are some things that you can plan for, but don't overdo the planning. You've got to be able to take on significant change as you go. And this was one of the big ones, one of many, actually, that we had to deal with. And then finally, in terms of my last takeaway, the thing that everybody majors on when you do a gig like the Olympics is the fact that you really cannot be late. And I remember before I took on the Olympics, lots of people saying to me, you know, IT project with a fixed date. You know, Jerry, you need your head looking at was the, uh, the, basically the tone of the typical comment I got. Well, you know what? Fixed deadlines are such good news. Why are they good news? I'll tell you, tell you why they're good news. Because if you're cute, you can use them to fix all those things that projects typically get in trouble because of. You can't get your requirements signed off. You always better sign them off today or we're going to postpone the opening ceremony. <coughs> Focus is the mind. <laughs> Suppliers delivering their software like, well, hey guys, it's your brand on the line. And so on. You also use it to, um, with one of the ways we got over the challenge of the deadline was to set earlier deadlines and put a lot of focus on them, so test events. In the run-up to the games, we ran 42 test events. That's how we made sure that all our suppliers, not only ready with their technology, but understood what operational support in the games context was all about. All of that really became possible because a fixed deadline that genuinely is fixed gives you, as program manager, basically the ability to, to, to drive what's going on. So, I'm now a huge fan of fixed deadlines, as long as they genuinely are fixed and there is no possibility to, uh, to get out of them. So, embrace deadlines. Despite appearances, they are really your ally. So, thank you. I think I've done that to time. Um, I think there's time now for a couple of questions if you have them. Shoot, one of the Uh, David Bickoff from uh, Government Computing. Um, thought struck me the difference between what you managed to deliver and uh, what we haven't managed to be delivered as far as uh, universal credit is concerned. <laughs> um, you obviously had a culture and a deadline to hit as far as this is concerned and everything as far as the Olympics is concerned. There's obviously a culture and political issues as far as departments within government are concerned. I wonder if you could sort of contrast the, sort of, the difference between what you managed to deliver as a successful project and what would appear to be a project that can't get fixed there. <laughs> um, well, I'm not going to make any comments on uh, any other organisation's uh, challenges that there, there might be, um, although I read the press saying the same as you do. Um, I think we did have the advantage, the considerable advantage, of being an organisation that was essentially set up for only one purpose, to deliver a great games. People who come to work for us have typically left their perfectly safe and sensitive day job and come and work to me and then be made redundant. That means we started with considerable focus and motivation. Because at the end of the day, if we didn't deliver the thing on time, what was the point of what we were doing? So there wasn't anywhere else to go. So I think you're right, that cultural focus was, was, was undoubtedly beneficial. Um, but that's probably all I want to say on that, on that topic. Maybe one last quick question for Jerry? Gentlemen in the middle of the question. Ian Miles, Central Shared Services. The, the sponsors that you, you put on the presentation, I think all by one were global players, so does the next host benefit from your efforts or does that all get sold again? Um, can you yes and no? So um, the, the, the IC have sponsors that tend to sign up with them for multiple Olympics. So for instance, Atos. Now with us, Atos we ended up redeveloping a lot of their software as well as some other people's software as well. And much of that will go and benefit RIA um, directly. Um, other stuff, for instance, the way we uh, designed our network with BT and Cisco, 
was very much UK centric, and as such, it won't provide any any benefit to the next one. It's quite interesting just to expand on on your theme behind your question. Does the IC mandate the knowledge management process between games? So my last task before I myself got made redundant was to go out to Rio. Tough gig, but someone's going to do it. And, and brief the next lot. Um, and in the same way that Beijing did the same for us just, just about the time I arrived at Local. So they mandate that. But the most important transfer of technology and information and knowledge is what goes on two legs. So there are a lot of people who used to work for me who are now working for the Rio Organising Committee. Um, and they're also working at Glasgow Commonwealth Games for next year and, and other places too. But there's quite a lot of movement that goes on. So it's, it's certainly the case that most games are able to build on at least some of what happened in another country um, the time before. Thanks very much, Jerry.